This is Pete Rollins, and this episode of Homebrewed Christianity is brought to you by Theology Beer Camp. This is an event where you'll see me humiliate Trip Fuller, <laughs> where you'll see me make him cry and pray to his God for salvation. Is that what you wanted? Well, Trip? I mean, you can't sponsor good? your own podcast, but if you live in Denver or you live in Oklahoma City yeah. or anywhere near it this August. And they're in, they're in America, yeah. Yes, they yes, are. they're the two American places. Two American places. Yeah, um, we're going to have theology beer camp in August, and people should clearly come. Oh yeah, because like you know, you only live once. It was supposed to be called theology gin camp, but I was uh, overruled. You were overruled. That's going to be the next one. Well, everyone has things on their wish list, but go to theologybeercamp dot com and come hang out with us this summer, um, and, and and maybe I'll cry. Uh, but it'll probably be because just I, if y'all have never seen Pete at karaoke, then then, uh, then 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 we have something in common because I have never seen me do karaoke either. Really? Yep. It was hard to watch yourself. Don't want to <laughs> videotape it. Well, well, well. You click play on the Homebrewed Christianity podcast. You know why? You must be smart, intelligent, beautiful, and down for some new ingredients to brew your own faith. Wow. That's right, yeah. Nathan. That is called Trip's Bucket of Affirmation. Man, I feel affirmed. Mm-hmm. Well, today on the podcast is Theodore, who goes by Ted Vial. Boom. I think it's Vial. We just listened to it to make sure I said it correctly. <laughs> it was Vial. But if you if you if you're going sports announcer, how do you how do you sports announcer? I want you know I wonder about that. Do they have Vial. it like? Do they have it like? Is there just a, a a phonetic pronunciation or? I don't know. Do they just know how to say some? Some of these names are you no. know people. If you want a secret, I regularly ask people how to pronounce their name correctly before mm-hmm. I hit record, and still fell. Yeah, wow. I have multiple emails from people that said you asked me how to say my name and got it wrong. It's not personal. You know what I blame? Um, the South. <laughs> the entire South. Yeah, I mean they can get blamed for other things too. Mm-hmm. We don't have to point mm-hmm. fingers, but um, <laughs> uh, it, it's bad. But look, Ted was awesome, and, and let me tell you right now, one. We talk about his new book, Modern Religion, Modern Race. The book is great. Like, if you're going to drop cheddar on a beautiful Oxford University Press theology book that talks about why everything that's going on today basically is based on 19th century German philosophy. Mm. And all the problems are there and some and some solutions that were missed and that I mean, basically, what I found out is that I would like Ted to be my neighbor when I was reading the book. There and you then go. He should have been after I did this interview, because I mean, he'll be our neighbor temporarily. Oh, conveniently, when? I think in August, maybe eighteenth and nineteenth. Oh, junk! That's right. He teaches at Iliff Theological Seminary in Denver, Colorado, who's a sponsor of Theology Beer Camp. Look at that! Go! Cool. Oh my goodness! It's, How convenient. It's very convenient. No. Oh, yeah. So, look, Iliff is a Methodist, but ecumenical, but mm-hmm. met, historically mm-hmm. Methodist, progressive seminary in Denver. They are awesome. Um, and we've had other professors from the school on. Some of them are going to be participating in theology peer camp. Uh, they even have uh, a Dr. Whitehead, who is a, who's a practical theologian. Who's not related to Whitehead, but into process theology. Well, I feel like you kind of have to be. Yeah, I know. Like, could you imagine your Dr. Whitehead, but a Hauerwasian? Ouch. No. No. Because you impossible. can't have a high quality last name like that. <laughs> um, can, and, and so, like, if you ever met a Dr. Whitehead who's just like, I'm a Bardian. I, I've never met a Dr. Whitehead, but well, I would be shocked well, if that was the only case. On, only on paper. That's right. Only on, paper. Only on paper, but now you're going to meet him in real life. And uh, but you met John Cobb. That's I, kind of like I did. I got to hang out with John Cobb at the original, the OG theology beer. Camp. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, uh, Ted and a bunch of other people from Isla are going to be at theology beer camp in Denver. And the next weekend, we're going to be in Oklahoma City. That's right. Twenty fifth, twenty sixth. Isla is sponsoring it. So if you are interested in theological education. Um, like in person, hybrid, online, and um, you say to yourself, 
Like, what type of theological institution recognizes the creative possibility of intense nerdification while day drinking in a church in Denver? Then Iliff does. Now, I don't. This is not the copy they gave me for their. No, it is not. That, so I, I, I don't know what elements of theology beer camp made them want to uh, be a part of it. But clearly, they they saw they saw the potential. So, hey, that's that's right. Yeah. No, no, I met I met uh, people from Iliff at the Progressive Youth Ministry Conference. That's right. So if you go to Progressive Youth Ministry Conference and you want to be at theology beer camp, then you're high quality people. That's right. Iliff might just be the place for you. Uh, yeah. Plus, plus uh, we. Candace, is Candace, currently. shout out to Candace. Mm-hmm. That's 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 right. See, I got her name correct, <laughs> and it could easily mess it up. It's just if your last name also correlates to a word I like to say at you regularly to slightly annoy you, then it's a lot easier. But Candace Dats will be at beer camp. That's right, and she's an Isle student, and from her Twitter. It's at least three to one compliments to complaints, and for a graduate student, that is that's impressive. And when she found out Ted was on the podcast, she was like, "Finally, I'm going to finish an episode." No, she didn't say that. I'm, I'm going to listen to this episode twice. Okay, that's better. Yeah, that sounds better. Um, but yeah, yeah. So theology beer camp. Peter Rollins is coming. We're going to have a good time. Uh, there's about uh, well, if you go to theologybeercamp.com. You'll find out there are so many local craft breweries sponsoring it. Uh, but I just want to say that last weekend, you know, when people mail you beer from beer camp sponsoring breweries, I had this Bohemian lager that was the jam. That sounds good. It sound it was like a beer made for hot and humid. Mm. And uh, it was uh, now I forgot the name of the brewery, but they got a red crowler. And then I had. Uh, this single hop IPA mm. from Platt Brewery, and it was also good. And so I, all I thought to myself was that uh, Ryan, mm-hmm. um, Ryan Miller, who is is one of the, the, one of the hosts of the yeah. Brew Theology Group, that and Janelle and Dan, they're doing a very good job. They're doing an excellent job. They're raising the bar because they were going to have to keep up with. Oh man, the Charlie. Godfather! Godfather, Charlie Sheldon in Oklahoma City is is got a beer a beer list is going to blow your face off. Uh, though he, Maybe literally, <laughs> and he's making his own beer, a gin infused something yeah, yeah, or another, just for Pete. Yeah, just so Pete will drink beer and not disgrace beer camp with his frilly drinks. Plus, you can't drink gin all day. No, you can't. You have to have a nice low alcohol. Beer. What kind of Irishman doesn't drink beer? You know what I mean? Uh, the same Irishman that likes gin the best. Jeez, oh man. What is that about? But we picked on Pete last week. If, yeah, we did. And we've already picked on the Haurasian Mafia. So this week, who needs to get taunted but people that don't like 19th century Germans? That's because right. Because Ted and I agree, if you, if you have a PhD in philosophy of religion, I told him in this interview or after it, I don't remember, that... I knew one day I wanted to get to teach a seminar called Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche. And that's what the title of it is, is Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche. And if you don't know what's up, you better ask somebody. <laughs> and in the fall, you teach Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche. And in the spring, you teach Schleiermacher. And that, whatever, however often I get to do that, would be my favorite year of teaching. Like that you have an upper level called Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and then you're just like, oh, y'all are going to be all 19th century in this junk up. It's going to be so good, so good. And then in the spring, you're like, Schleiermacher, and it's going to be amazing. (laughs) And he's like, I completely understand. (laughs) So I don't know. I don't know if if uh, if we can come up with a game about 19th century Germans for beer camp. But if we do, if you have ideas, tweet at us. Oh. It, it, Trip and Ted plays uh, oh, a Trip and Ted's century, Excellent Adventure. Trip and Ted's <laughs> Excellent Adventure in a 19th century German theology and philosophy. Done. There it is. All right. So here, that's another reason. <laughs> so if for some reason you are not the person that wants to see that, you should go to beer camp and throw stuff at us. But if you are <laughs> someone that wants to see Trip and Ted's Excellent Adventure in a 19th century German theology and philosophy, then you should go to Theology Beer Camp. Because that is where it's happened. Or dats, 
where it's that's like, what's that's what's up. That's what's up. That doesn't make sense. You know, I thought that's what's happening. That's what's up. You know, I, it's, oh, I that's know. what's up. Yeah, yeah. But you said that's exactly. Uh huh. Also, uh, you should get the book Modern Race, Modern Religion, and uh, what else were you supposed to say? I was kind of theologybeercamp.com. Yeah. If you want to be a supporter of this, because we're going for one percent of the listeners being members. Yeah, if we could get one percent of the I listeners, found out, I know. If we had one percent, if one percent of the listeners became members of the site, then, um, like your wife would like me more because I'd pay you more. <laughs> so you should clearly do that. Yeah, but don't don't think that it correlates to to like editing it more. <laughs> like you can't pay to get rid of these introductions. We work hard at these. Yeah, they'll be even better. Even better. We'll do more of them. In we'll just row. do an episode where it's just intros. Yeah. I did that once. <laughs> and uh, it was with the OG co-host, Chad. Mm. We didn't release it. But it was epic. I bet it was. And uh, yeah, it was. Coming up on almost 10 years ago. Almost. Almost 10 years ago. Wow. Um, it, we also had a first episode that I'm, I hope is completely destroyed off the internet at this point. If you become a homebrew community member, you might be able to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, go to homebrewcommunity.com. You can get yourself your uh, your own ecclesiastical title. Yeah, you can be an acolyte, a deacon. Bishop. An elder. That's right. And it, if you want to be really cool like Larry, you and can... And Cincinnati. Yeah. You can create your own title. You create your own title. And you might get a... Uh, Kegerator magnet mailed to your house with your title on. That's right. Because you never know. You gotta give the people what they want. You know what I mean? That's right. If they're like, I can't deal with those normal titles. I'm too special. I and need I to be wa- canon to the extraordinary. Yep, that's right. This episode is dedicated to Larry and 19th century German philosophers because Ted's awesome. All right. Enjoy. Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and today on the podcast is Theodore, but he goes by Ted Avile. He teaches at Iliff out in Denver, and they are not only um, it happen to be in the same city as Theology Beer Camp this summer. Uh, They're one of the sponsors, so uh, I'm I'm super pumped. Not just because your book Modern Religion, Modern Race is good, but because um, I'm. Uh, I'm my my uh, fidelity is is uh, simply attached to people that love theology beer camp. So I'm I'm just anticipating a wonderful conversation. It should be good. I'm hoping to come to the camp. And I got to say, I looked up the stats online, and Colorado's got the uh, third highest craft breweries per capita in the country. Oh, I know it. It it is uh you know doing craft beer things, and when you leave California, is very hard sometimes. Because you 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 go. I've done the podcasts in cities. I don't have to name them, but uh, <laughs> they're like we have our own brewery in town, and we're going to do it there. And then you go, and the beer's not good. <laughs> I mean, it's it's only good if your other option is like Miller Lite. Then right, you're like, right. I guess. But uh, no, um, a couple weeks ago, the breweries that are all going to be a part of beer camp in Denver and in Oklahoma. All, we all mailed each other boxes of beer and did beer tastings. Oh, nice. So I tasted a bunch of the Denver breweries and the ones from Oklahoma City, and then people in Denver uh, tasted from L.A. and Oklahoma and vice versa. So, you know, just it, it there's a lot of preparation that goes into putting yeah, it That's right. A lot of hard work. Lots of hard work. Yeah, and, late uh, night hours. Yeah. So so maybe before we before we kind of uh, talk about your book, say tell us a little bit about uh, your school and and how you ended up uh, teaching there. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Iliff is uh, is a great place to teach. Uh, I honestly I came up on the in my graduate studies kind of through the religious studies side of things. I didn't really envision being at a seminary, but Iliff is pretty open minded, so they were happy to hire me, and I'm by far the you know, I'm far from the strangest person on the faculty. Uh, Who's so, that? <laughs> so we can talk more about that later. But it's got so it's the only mainline seminary in the Rocky Mountain region. So so what that means is it's affiliated with the Methodist Church. But we have uh, everybody who wants to get an MDiv comes to Isla. So we've got Lutherans, we've got Presbyterians, um, we've got people who want to um, 
the military chaplains and their traditions don't have MDIB. So we have Mormons, we have Wiccans, uh, we've got Buddhists, we've got everybody here. So it makes for a pretty um, interesting and engaging kind of environment to mm-hmm. study to study religion in. So I've I've loved it here. Sweet. Well, um, so before before coming out to Denver, what were you up to? Uh, like what you said, you kind of came in through the religion studies route. Maybe, maybe for people who, who don't know the difference, uh, let us know. Like if you listen to the podcast, you hear lots of theologians, philosophers, some biblical yeah. studies people, but they tend to be ones who their academic, uh, career is connected to the, also their confessional, uh, location. Um, can you describe what the difference is? You noticed like some of the major differences in just the study of religion in general? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think this is changing. It's changed a lot since I've been teaching, but, but when I was in college and graduate school, there was almost a war going on between uh, people who study religion who were theologians and then people who were adamantly not theologians. And, and what the theologians would say is uh, if you're doing it, from outside, then you, you don't really understand what you're studying. You don't have a sense of it. Uh, I had one professor in graduate school compare it to trying to be a musicologist while you're tone deaf, if you're not religious. Uh, and then from the other side, from the religious studies side, they just would accuse theologians of being kind of closet secret uh, proselytizers who were pretending to, to do good scholarship, but really had a secret agenda. Uh, and, and it got pretty nasty for a while. I think, um, Recently, uh, it's, it's settled down a bit because I think partially because of the, everybody in academia for a while has been doing postmodern studies and everybody understands that they have sort of partial commitments to this and that and that the differences between the way that we study stuff isn't really that big. So the, the fights have ca- kind of calmed down. There's still a few old school warriors left, but the fights have kind of calmed down. So when you were a, a graduate student, what, or, or maybe an undergrad, when was it that the study of religion became interesting enough that you said, you know what, I think I'm going to do this professionally? Yeah, that's a great question. So I thought I was going to be a philosophy major because I thought I wanted to know like what was true. Uh, and what I found out studying philosophy is that what you learn in philosophy is every generation of philosophers will tell you exactly why the previous generation of philosophers was 100% wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then and then and then they say this is actually what's true, and then the next guy comes down the pike and says, actually, that guy was totally wrong, right? So uh, so that got a little tiresome. <laughs> I, I always joke that philosophers are like uh, it's it's every it's youth group with beards. Like every youth group is like <laughs> our parents are the worst that have ever happened. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. That's, right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So then so then I just happened to take a, a religious studies class, and what I discovered was that in religious studies, the, the way it was done in, in, at my college was they covered a lot of the same stuff, a lot of the same thinkers, but the question was not who's right and who's wrong. The question was, like, what does the world look like to these people such that this way of thinking or acting or believing makes sense, right? And that's a much more interesting question to me because, because uh, you know, every everybody who's not you has beliefs that you think are wacky. And the, the whole point of academia, in my opinion, is to say, hey, let's assume that person's not irrational or crazy or childish. Let's assume that they're normal and let's let's uh, figure out what, the, what their world is like such that this set of beliefs, which to me seems kind of loopy, actually makes total sense to them. Mm-hmm. So, that, so when I started doing that, I started saying, oh, okay, this is a much more interesting question. Uh, and I had a, an advisor who loved 19th century philosophy and theology. So oh, yeah. I fell in love with 19th century philosophy and theology. Uh, and I went to graduate school saying, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a religious studies guy who understands why this 19th century stuff happened the way it happened. Uh, and, and, and when I got to graduate school, the wars were still going between theologians and religious studies people. And, and, and the, they just, it was Wendy Doniger. She's a famous scholar of Hinduism, uh, in the history, history of religions program at Chicago, which was kind of the, uh, the religious studies side of things. And she just basically said to me, if you're studying Protestants, you need to go hang out with the theologians. So I did. And it was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of 19th century dead Germans. That's, uh, yeah, there we go. I, I, I don't know. I, I want to, I told uh, my mom when I was deciding whether or not to do a PhD, I said, yeah, but is there any other way of getting to eventually getting paid to teach a class called Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche? Because that's yeah. what I have. Like one of my goals, I'm like, I want to I want to be somewhere yeah. where I have to teach that every two years. And I don't know what you have to do to do that, but it surely includes a PhD. 
So it does. Now banking's not going to cut it. No, and and at Claremont where I did my PhD, they have a program called Philosophy of Religion and Theology. So mm-hmm. it's kind of you end up doing lots of continental philosophy and religious studies and uh, kind of contemporary theological traditions. So uh, it's it's that hybrid and quite a bit of fun. Yeah. Uh, so that that makes that makes a lot of sense. So when when you when you fell in love with these uh, 19th century thinkers and are going back to write a book on religion and race, uh, kind of explain to us what modern religion is before you even get to the concept of race. I think religion is one of those words everyone is, is – they don't examine what the word is because everyone right. knows. We all know what religion is. That's how you have a department to study it. That's right. This is why when you're flying on an airplane, you tell the guy next to you that you're a historian. Because <laughs> right? he already knows what religion is. He's going to tell you all about the stuff you've spent your life studying, oh. and he's going to be right, right? Oh, yeah, they're the best. Yeah. So, so, you just have, so you that's just a, tell him, I have a podcast. Am I allowed to tell this story of the leader? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so one of the things that's interesting about, about uh, religious studies is that what you quickly learn is that religion is not a stable category, that it's changed over time changed radically over time. And, and, uh, so I, um, I mean, I can walk through some of the changes, but the, but what I, one of the reasons I love the 19th century is because to me, it seems like if you, if you're trying to figure out what's in your head and why you think the way you think and why the ideas that seem natural to you seem natural to you, the 19th century is where a lot of that stuff gets shaped in the ways that we still sort of take for granted today. So a lot of people who study the history of religion, just the category of what do we mean, what does the word cover semantically when we're talking about religion, they, they, they'll trace it through the ancient world and through the medieval world, and then they'll trace it up to the Enlightenment. Uh, and, and I'm pretty confident that there's another stage that's necessary, that what we sort of uh, think religion is, uh, what Tomoko Masazawa calls the, you know, the living world religions that are roughly equivalent, we can kind of compare them. That idea is kind of shaped in the 19th century and it's shaped uh, a lot by Friedrich Schleiermacher, mm-hmm. I think. So, so, uh, so what that means is this is idea that, that it's not that there's true and false religion, right? If you, if you, you know, I mean, Swingley actually wrote a book called On True and False Religion, right? But for Schleiermacher, it's not true and false. It's that different cultures, different peoples have different intuitions about the infinite. Mm-hmm. And so, and that's normal. That's natural. And they're all good. Uh, uh, and that the question is not which is the correct religion, but are you an authentic Buddhist in your own context? Of course, at the end of the day, he does think eventually everybody will want to be a Christian. But, but in the meantime, go ahead and be a Hindu. That's all right. So um, w- when you think of all the different a definitions of religion. What are the what are the ones that when you run into them, you have to decide whether or not you're going to kind of become a professor or not. Like what are when you think of public square conversations around religion, what, what are the questions and running definitions that you go, oh, really? Maybe you should have a, <laughs> it. Maybe there should be an introduction to religious studies in high school because we really need to cut this off at the pass. Yeah. So that's, yeah. So I think if you, if you just go out on the street and ask people what religion is, they'll probably come up with something like, uh, it's a belief in God or gods. Um, and then the question is, you know, which beliefs do you have and are they the correct beliefs or are they rational or irrational? Uh, and, and, uh, I, um, I don't think it's a very good definition of religion, actually. Uh, in fact, I, I, uh, one of the, I think I really got interested in studying religion in college, but I, I was sort of predisposed to do that, uh, uh, because I learned this lesson kind of at an early age. My, my parents were super religious, uh, and they super, it was very important to me that I go to church. It was important to them that I go to church, and it was important to me. Like, I wasn't a slacker kid, but I, I, I definitely was a skeptical kid, and I kind of felt, um, uh, like hypocritical sitting there and talking about the resurrection when I was pretty sure it didn't happen. Uh, and so my parents, you know, we had this long conversations about should I or should I not go to church. And, and to me at that point, I had this naive definition of religion, like here's a set of propositions about the world and I don't agree with them. Therefore I can't be a member of the group. Right. Uh, and my dad, uh, my dad was a chemist, uh, and pretty rational guy. And so I just point blank asked him like, dad, resurrection, do you think it happens? Uh, and he said, yes, but he's, he actually sat and thought for a really long time before he answered. Uh, and I realized that he had never actually directly asked himself that question before. Hmm. 
So that was my first clue that like, oh, religion's actually about something else for him. It's about, he's a member of this community he grew up in. It shaped his life. It gave his life meaning. It's all of his contacts and associations and family and friends. Uh, and it might entail certain beliefs about the resurrection. Uh, but, but he didn't join it because he thought, oh, yeah, the resurrection. What a great idea. Let me sign on to that club. So yeah. that was my first clue that like, okay, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a community of people with certain practices uh, and things in common. And part of what they have in common is certain beliefs that that may actually not be the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So when um, a, a lot of times in uh, kind of contemporary context, religion, especially in the West, is regularly just defined by Western religions. So when you start to think of wisdom traditions in the East and things, uh, are there particular elements uh, or, or the relationship of East and West that forces us to reevaluate what we mean by religion? Yeah, I think so. So, so one of the, one of the, uh, uh, I, I think well, that's, that's a complicated question. <laughs> so let me, let me take two different stabs at it. I think one of the things that say, I think every college kid goes through a phase where they want to be a Buddhist and every college kid goes through a phase where they love Kierkegaard. Like those are the, like the two stages oh, of yeah. college. I wanted to be a Taoist, but I didn't okay. love Kierkegaard. Close enough. Yeah, yeah. Close enough. And I think part of it is because, because, uh, if you if you grow up in a Christian house or a Christian tradition or, or sort of in a Christian culture, just the ideas, if you take a world religions course and they say, oh, here's the Four Noble Truths, they just sound awesome. Uh, and they, they actually make, make a little more sense uh, than some of the Christian doctrines. Uh, the, the problem comes here. The problem, the problem comes where if you think that all religions are the same, basically, but they might have slightly different ideas, uh, I mean, I'm not too judgmental when people glom onto different religious traditions in their personal lives, but if you're going to study religions, you're going to make a mistake about what Buddhism is and what, what's important to the community and how it helps that community, you know, form itself and shape its practices. Uh, and you're going to think that they're just like your parents church only better. Uh, and you're going to get completely wrong, not just incorrect, but you're going to sort of do damage in the way that you think about how other cultures are and how they should be. And you're going to make judgments about them that are going to not be correct. So, so that's the point at which, yes, everybody should be assigned a religious studies course. So, you know, their categories aren't universal and that what they're expecting to see may not be actually what's happening out there at all. Mm -hmm. So when, um, when you mention kind of the, your own interest in Schleiermacher, maybe uh, take us back to the 19th century and why his understanding of religion and the way he uh, describes it has uh, been influential for the West, but also just for, for you. Yeah. Okay, great. So, so Schleiermacher is interesting. I think he's a great theologian. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and he's the first, his sort of, his, the role of the, the role of importance he plays in the history of the Christian theological tradition is that he's the first great systematic theologian to come down the pike after the enlightenment. Right. So, so, so if you think about the enlightenment uh, in terms of people like, you know, Thomas Jefferson, John Locke, David Hume, Voltaire, all these people are super skeptical about revealed religion. Um, it looks in Schleiermacher's day, like he had two options in front of him. Uh, thinking particularly about how to think about Jesus, right? And, and one option was the kind of traditional one, which he called magical, where Jesus just has these supernatural plays, like Superman who comes down from another planet to save the day, right? And, and Schleiermacher thought, okay, I, uh, that's the way I was raised. That's what I'm supposed to believe. But that makes me say things that I don't actually, yeah. in my heart of hearts, I can't buy into, right? Uh, you know, he's, this is the age of science. The, you know, he doesn't want to violate the laws of nature. Uh, the second option is the sort of enlightenment deist option where Jesus is a great moral teacher, maybe even greater than Socrates, but that's it. And Schleiermacher thinks, well, that's religiously unsatisfying. I mean, deist churches tend not to last that long, right? Uh, and it, it, he had a profound personal sense of the ongoing presence of Christ in the world and, 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 uh, and Deus can't account for that, right? Deus, he, the thing that's great about Jesus for Deus is just he had some cool ideas, which we've been teaching each other, right? So, so Schleiermacher comes up with a third option, which becomes sort of the go-to option in the 19th century, which is to say what theology is, is not, it's not like philosophy. It's not like ideas about the world. 
But what theology is, is it's just a reflection on your experience, right? So he has had an experience of forgiveness and grace and, and your, you know, your experience can't be wrong. It's not a question of, is your experience, is Trip Fuller, is your experience the correct? It's just your experience. It is what it is. And theology just unpacks that in language that makes it available and lets you think through it. Uh, so, so, so Schleiermacher's claim goes something like this, right? Here's what Jesus does. Jesus has an, a perfect, he's the only human ever to have this perfect awareness of God. Everything Jesus thinks and does is done in the complete awareness of the presence of God. And that makes Jesus a super compelling, charismatic figure. And people grab, people sort of glom onto him and gather around him. And when you do that, it's like a, it's like a click in high school, right? The cool kid gathers other kids around him and they start like wearing their hat sideways and the pants the same way and the same gestures, the same speech patterns. Uh, so, so that's what the early Christians did. They gathered around Jesus. And in those gestures and ways of speaking are embedded ways of thinking and experiencing the world, right? So, so that, so that, that though the community that forms around Jesus and that picks up his speech patterns and his ideas actually embodies the personality of Jesus. The same way that the high school kid probably now is at Harvard Business School, but there's still that click in the high school that's, you know, wearing their hat sideways and is super cool, right? So, so Jesus dies, no longer physically present on earth, but in the church community founded by Jesus, there is Jesus's personality. And when you join the church, you meet his personality and are transformed by it in exactly the same way that the first disciples were. Mm -hmm. So that lets, that, that lets Schleimacher have, um, uh, the real presence of Jesus that the traditional Christian beliefs held on to, but it didn't require any sort of magical violation of the laws of nature. Right. And so when you join the church community, you have this experience of redemption. And then what theologians do is simply say, all right, let's put that into a sort of a language that our colleagues at the university can talk about too. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's his role. That's, so that's that I think, you know, that's, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe uh, how do you, or how does Schleiermacher understand the relationship then of, of theology? If it's, you know, this very situated reflection on the experience of those in uh, the wake of Christ or in the community of Christ, how, how does that language and stuff connect to his philosophical writings around the reality of the ultimate? In yeah. That, stuff? Okay. That's a great question. So, 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 uh, he actually was the president of the Berlin Royal Philosophical Society. He, he blackballed Hegel because he didn't like Hegel. Right? Uh, so, so he, he, he's pri he's, his primary actually self identification is as a preacher, right? He, he says, if I could, if, I, if anybody remembers for anything, me for anything, please remember me as, as a servant of the word, right? And he's got this theology position at the university and he has philosophical interests too. I mean, he, he makes contributions in, uh, in hermeneutics, in, uh, in political theory, in epistemology. He translated and, Plato. And yeah, he, yes, he translates Plato. It's, which is still available in German. It became the standard translation of Plato. So, so he, uh, one of the things I, I learned Schleiermacher the theologian in graduate school. And later I started reading Schleiermacher the philosopher. And one of the things I appreciate about him is he's pretty clear about which hat he's wearing when he's doing both of them. So he'll say things like, uh, he, he's got an argument about how in your experience, everybody experiences the infinite, mm -hmm. right? But he's pretty clear that when I'm a Christian, when I'm a philosopher, I can't really say that much about the infinite. I can just tell you how it affects me, Right. But when I take that hat off and put on the Christian theologian's hat, the difference is Christians have language which allows us to talk about the infinite in specific ways and say more about it. But I'm not trying to make a philosophical argument this is true. I'm just saying this is a matter of belief that helps shape our community. And that's where he talks about – that's where he stops sounding like such a pantheist and sounds more like he's got a, a personal God that he mm -hmm. believes in. And that's appropriate language for a certain community. It's not appropriate in the philosophy department, but it is appropriate in church. Mm -hmm. And he's very clear when he's, you know, when he's doing which one. Well, in, in, um, I know a, a lot of people, I think, uh, don't quite get Schleiermacher because of how post liberals treated him. And yeah. so he got caricatured and dismissed. 
But in drawing the distinction between the two, I think in one sense, he's saying, yeah, like if you, if you think the language you use in Christian worship and in Christian prayer and in, in our, in our confessions and stuff like that, uh, is, is tantamount to the same use of language uh, that a logician does in a, in a, in a philosophy seminar, then it, the one who's losing here is theology. Yeah. Like, because it is actually talking about the, the deepest are the, the language that comes out. And he calls theology like a second order discourse. It's the language yeah. that comes out of, uh, us. At this very deep level connected to, uh, to the ultimate in a way that it, it is, uh, thematized because of our connection with Christ and in the life and worship of the church. And it would, why would you ever hurt the church as to tell her that what she's really doing is what these philosophers can discuss when they've never come to call Jesus the Christ? Right. Like, that's, that is offensive and it's not right for philosophers, but it's definitely not right to Christians because we all know little old lady over here is a better Christian than you'll ever be. And she uses the words correctly because it shapes her character like Christ. And I'm tired of you telling me that philosophers do a better job. I mean, it's like anti Hegel. Uh, it is. Yeah, that's like, exactly right. That's exactly right. And it is. It's so, so a, uh, I mean, so, so Schleimacher's favorite famous line. So, so the book that gets him famous and sort of inaugurates this period of liberal theology is his speeches on religion, right? In 1799. And in that book, he says famously uh, that religion is neither thinking nor doing. So it's not philosophy and speculation, nor is it like Kantian Ethics. moral behavior. Like if you, it's, if you don't dance and don't smoke, you're a good Christian. It's neither thinking nor doing, but feeling by which he means the universe impinges on you in certain ways and, and you soak that up and, and that's the source of religion, right? So, so your, uh, awareness of this infinite cosmic unity out there that made you what you are, right? That's the source of religion. And, and if you step out of that into speculation, uh, you're not doing religion anymore. You're doing philosophy. Guess what? The philosophers are going to win that fight because, because that's what they do for a living, right? But what, but the second thing you said is absolutely true, right? It's also bad for the church uh, because it mistakes. So this is one of the things that can go haywire, right? With with theology is if it if it mistakes itself for philosophy, it actually damages that feeling, which is the point of worship for Schleiermacher is to circulate that feel. It's like it's like a when you had those Hot Wheels and there was that generator that made them spin around and keep them going forever, right? Like worship functions as a, like that generator that rein, reinvigorates you. And if, and if your minister is up there doing philosophy and it's a boring service, you're not going to catch that, you know, effervescence that, that Durkheim called it, right. You're not going to get that feeling re, revivified. Uh, and so, and so making that mistake also damages, as you say, the church. Yeah. I, I like to think of it kind of like, uh, at least I, I, I grew up in the free church tradition. So when, when we're hardcore about separation of church and state, it's just because we know if they get in bed, the church loses as well. This isn't right. like a, oh, we want more faith-based initiatives or whatnot. No, the, the whole reason you keep the church and state separate is so that you're protecting the freedom of all people's conscience and the ability to act out of it. And, and not, you're not just protecting your own and wanting to yeah. get access over here. And no, that's right. And Schleiermacher, you know, he's in, in Germany still, but in, in Schleiermacher's Prussia, right? He's a civil servant. He's hired yeah. by the state. So he's happy to pick up a paycheck, but he's very clear. He, he, he has a couple of epic battles with the king of Prussia trying to get the kingdom back out of church business. Uh, because, you know, uh, everybody would get together on Sunday morning and the, the government would say, hey, this is a perfect time to tell farmers how to vaccinate their cattle. And Schleimacher's like, well, that's actually not the message of Christianity. So, like, back off, right? We're not going to do that on Sunday morning. Well, you just have to have a free-range grass-fed cattle, and then and then you can go to Episcopal Church. That's, the, that's uh, the way Jesus did. <laughs> so, when you when you're looking at the way, uh, uh, like Schleiermacher developed this, how how does his kind of modern conception of religion uh, show up unacknowledged today? Yeah. So I think, I think when, like when students sign up for a course on world religions, I mean, A, just this idea, uh, that there are sort of valid 11 or I don't know, you have different lists, but 11 or 12 valid world religions. Uh, and it's not that necessarily that, that mine is right and yours is wrong is already a Schleiermacher idea. Uh, and this idea that, um, that religions, uh, are linked 
to different geographic and cultural areas mm-hmm. and that that's okay. And that they actually are part of like a healthy dynamic, uh, cultural development, uh, such that it's not a great idea to proselytize, uh, because instead of actually helping, you know, Dallas and China, what we're actually doing is, is imperialistic imposing a different culture on them. Like those are all kind of Schleiermacherian ideas. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you start, um, uh, out of this kind of interest in 19th century, uh, philosophy and religion and stuff. And then, uh, in your newest book, also start to look at the, the concept of race and the way it's shaped and played out in the West. What was the kind of first point of contact where you go, like, this is an investigation worth spending time in unpacking, connecting dots? Yeah. That, okay. That's a great question. So, so, uh, so I really only, and I'm pretty upfront with my students about this. I only know one thing. Uh, and I, and every class is on the same subject. And that thing really is that everything you think is normal about the world came out of the 19th century. <laughs> so, so I think there are, there are four or five like basic, uh, categories that we use to organize our world and to think about our own identity. Uh, and if, so if you ask somebody like, what are you, you know, what really are you, uh, and, and you, you know them well enough or can trust them enough that, that you'll get an honest answer. Like what, what they think you're asking about are things like religion, nationality, gender, race, maybe class, right? Those are like the basic, uh, ways that we, sh- that we think about our identity in the modern world. Uh, and I had a pretty good sense coming out of graduate school that religion, uh, had changed in the 19th century. Uh, and I started thinking about, well, what's the relationship of religion and nationality? And what's the relationship of religion and some of these other things? And I was kind of, uh, naively shocked when I realized that actually like religion, race also is not a universal category, right? It, not everybody uses race to sort people. And even in the West, people didn't use race until relatively recently. And biologists certainly tell us that it doesn't actually exist. So then the question is, how come we can't stop sorting people by race? How come we, how come our, how come we think about race in such fixed ways that even when people tell us it's a construct, we can't knock it off, right? Uh, and, and the, 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 my, the gut instinct was, well, it's got to have something to do with this early 19th century. And so I started poking around and, and lo and behold, like there's somebody sitting there like Schleiermacher or, 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 uh, Herder, who's another sort of big figure in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I started thinking, Hey, these guys actually shaped this category too. What if they're linked? What if they overlap a little bit? What if, uh, theologians who are not, who are good progressive, like we don't like racism theologians. And what if like good progressive, scholars of religion who are comparing religions. What if, what if the category of religion and the category of race sort of mutually formed each other such that we're talking about race, even when we don't think we're talking about race. Uh, and so I started poking around and, and, uh, and I was blown away by what I found. Uh, do you, one of the things that, um, in, I guess today we don't automatically think of is that there was a time where the, uh, there were active proponents out of sci- you know, in science arguing that race was like an actual legitimate, you know, biological yeah. category and that the origins of that you would have had essentially separate evolutionary tracks to the different races. And then, uh, surprisingly, uh, scientists tended to find their own as the uh, superior one. Right. Uh, but then, what are the odds? But then, uh, yeah, anthropologists and such have got back and they're like, "Oh no, actually, there's kind of uh, one shared mother." Um, we don't have to go into the how that works in checking uh, that out scientifically, but <laughs> right. that that you know, all of a sudden, you know, we have these categories that you're talking about, like religion, race, nationality, gender, and things. Um, that's like what you fill out when you fill out a census, yeah. and uh, and and they started. They were, they started being things we tracked as Westerners uh, with nation states and, and markets. Um, and we, we used to have some myths that we believed about them being like real and essential. And now they're not biologically, uh, you know, they aren't biological definitions. They're sociological and, and cultural and they're connected, uh, in different ways. So when, you know, as, as the science and stuff came to be, came to change in things, uh, how did you, like, how did mo- these more progressive thinkers and stuff kind of r- relate that conversation and culture of, 
uh, you know, their nationality, this concept of race or, or, or ethnic group and, and religion. Yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, so most of the people who think about the, about the history of race, uh, and the way people thought about race, um, uh, by the way, the word only enters European languages pretty late, right? I mean, it's, it's, I think the 16th century where there's the first, it's in Spencer's Fairy Queen, you get the first mention of race in English. And he really means something like a household, like a head, there's a, you know, a Potter familias and some and some offspring and uh, it really only comes to mean kind of large chunks of humanity uh, pretty late um, and most people who have written on the topic of race have said that that really takes its final shape in the Enlightenment so you get people like you know David Hume uh, looking around the world and dividing up people by by into into large groups like four or five groups of people. Uh, and then making very disparaging comments about non-Europeans, right? Non-white Europeans. Uh, and Kant does the same thing, which is kind of shocking for Kant because, uh, because Kant's the great, uh, universalists, uh, you know, treat others, uh, always as an ends and never as a means only. It's like sort of the basis of universal human rights. Uh, and then, so, so he's got this sort of wonderful, marvelous universal moral theory, which is beautiful. I mean, it is beautiful. Uh, and then I'll say horrible, horrible things about, you know, blacks, Indians, Asians. And you're, it's like, how does those two things go together? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so here's the, here's where the 19th century comes back into it. Right. Uh, the way that race works, I think in the modern world, in our world is we do sort of, um, split people up into groups based on, uh, uh, physical markers, most typically skin color, but there's some other ones that people use too, right? Uh, by the way, those are, those are artificial. Even Kant knows, like if you line, if you took everybody in the world and lined them up standing next to each other from lighter to darker, you couldn't tell the difference between any two people standing next to each other, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, there would just be imperceptible differences. So Kant says, look, there's a confusing variety of, of, uh, of skin colors out there of the way people look. In order to understand what's going on, we have to impose like digital categories on this analog spectrum of colors, right? So Kant knows that race is something that we impose on the world, unless he thinks it's real. And, and the question is, how do we, how do we account for the differences, right? Uh, what the 19th century does is, uh, is it says this, your membership in a group. So now we're sort of circling back to Schleiermacher's theology, right? Your membership in a group is what makes you who you are. It determines the, the, the language that you use, the gestures that you use, which, which um, is more than a matter of sort of uh, cultural identity. It actually, it, it creates the world for you, right? Mm -hmm. that, that the very language you use is what makes your experience of the world possible. And because people speak different languages and have different gestures, they're going to experience different worlds, right? Um, and so it's, it's, the, it's the heritors and the Schleiermachers who come off, in terms of 19th century dead white guys, pretty good on the topic of race, right? They're not, they're not virulent racists, but they provide this way of linking group membership to cultural assumptions that we make about people, right? And that's what modern race is. If I think I know what group you belong to, and I know what that group is like because they have, they share a culture, then I can make certain assumptions about you. In, in the, oh, I don't remember, somewhere in the first half of the book, you talk about, and the, this, the way in which, from Kant on, uh, assessments of difference were tended to be put in teleological narratives, so yeah. that the differences themselves are best accounted for in a story with a goal and progress that uh, I guess tends to put uh, racial differences or ethnic and, and that type of differences that you, you have this tendency. Uh, of, of putting them in a narrative where there is a direction and a goal and progress being made. Yeah, that's so, so yeah. So, th so this is kind of the, 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 the nub of the argument here, right? Is that everybody who I know, I know a lot of nice people, like, they read Kant <laughs> and they're just horrified by what he has to say about race. Right. And, and the way he ranks, he says, you know, whites are the best and then, and then Asians and then, and then Negroes, and then the worst of all are the, uh, the American Indians, right? Um, 
and you just can't read that and not cringe, right? It's just well, he horrible. spent a lot of time with him. You know, Kant was one. Well, of those, he's a world right, traveler. Right. He spent a couple years with Cherokees. Uh, just that's getting right. to know. That's right. That's right. No, he actually, he literally thought like, because I live in Königsberg and support city, I pretty much know everything about the world. <laughs> right. So, uh, so, <laughs> but here's the thing, right? Uh, one of the arguments that Kant makes, and I actually think he's right about this argument is you need a framework to make sense of the world for you, right? The world is too confusing. Uh, so you need to impose a kind of a framework. And for Kant, this framework is a narrative. It's a teleological narrative where history is aiming towards a certain goal. And, and the, the historical evidence is ambiguous because people are jerks, right? But, but basically, you have to assume that we're moving towards a certain goal in order to be able to understand how events are related to each other and how they're moving us towards that goal, right? Uh, I think that's true, actually. I think humans do have to have a framework. I think what's interesting about modernity is that there have been other frameworks and that from Kant on, we do have this kind of linear historical progressive framework. I think that's one of the things that makes us modern Westerners, right? So, so I ask when I give talks, I, I ask people to think about parts of the world that they think are more or less developed, right? Or more or less, um, you can choose any criterion you want, like more or less, uh, people have freedom of conscience. People are, people can flourish. Uh, people, uh, have the ability to f- express themselves freely. Uh, if you just think for a second about, about, uh, about places in the world that do that better or worse, mm-hmm. right? So in other words, I think when we theorize difference, we place people on this linear narrative. Are we, are we moving closer or further away from the end of history, right? And then just think about what the people there look like. And by and large, it turns out that the places we think are more developed look like the people sort of at the top end of Kant scale, and the places that are less developed look like the people at the bottom of Kant scale. And we're actually, even though we know that his language is offensive, we're still kind of caught in the same way of thinking. We haven't made that much progress. We're, we're actually not that much better than Kant when it comes to topics of race, mm-hmm. which is depressing. <laughs> well, yes. The... Uh... Do you, do you think that like when you start creating a taxonomy like that, like I, I'm always struck that uh, like in Hegel's lectures on philosophy of religion, uh, you know, we have like four or five different versions of him doing the lecture series. Yeah. And now he's got categories. He just switches all the, all the religions. He doesn't, yeah. he doesn't really know that well. And, you know, he was actually interested in other religions and you can see like, oh, I actually read Buddhist text. I'm going to bump him up a category. This is legit. Yeah. Uh, and then he, he reads some articles uh, from missionaries in the new world. He's like, we'll move these down. Um, but right. he has like these categories and stages of religion and in where different groups fit fluctuates. But, uh, you know, who's at the top of it and, uh, what it says about uh, what you in your other religions do um, doesn't change. Like he's always as uh, from the outside speaking on behalf of these different groups. Um, uh, it, towards the end of your book, you, you talk about uh, the need both to engage in learning this w- w- thinking with these Western thinkers and what the products of their thinking is, but also learning to think, uh, with and engage those that uh, didn't have a voice in the production of these categories. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you kind of describe what it's like or, 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 or what it's like to engage both? Cause I think we all know people who um, would go like, Oh, see, I like the first half of your book. This is why we should not read Kant Hegel. Oh, uh, the 19th century is horrible. Um, let's get rid of it and move right. on. But what's the generative encounter uh, or the generative role they play today? Yeah, so that's a super important question because I, I mean, I have colleagues uh, who just uh, who who's make exactly the claim that you just made, which is that these guys are horrible, they're racist, and so we shouldn't teach them, right? We should just tuck them away, right? And and what I try to show in the book is that uh, is that they're already inside your head, right? This goes back to my undergraduate experience of why do we think the way we do? Well, a lot of the way we think is shaped by the 19th century, so they're already in there, whether you want to teach them and read them or not, right? Mm-hmm. So so. So this idea, uh, the other important idea, I think one is, is one we've been talking about, which is that there's a sort of linear progressive narrative that we use to, to frame our experience, right? The other one that I think comes out of the 19th century is it's, 
is a theological anthropology, right? I think, I think, uh, which to me is always the central doctrine in every systematics. I think every systematics is, is driven by theological anthropology. And, and the 19th century one is this one of human flourishing, right? It's that, is that what it means to be fully dignified human is this ability to express yourself and take historical action and, and, and make a, more or less uh, the freedom to make a mark on the world by, by impressing your personality on it. Right. Uh, I think that's the default theological anthropology of the West. And so that when we look at places around the world, like China or Africa, and we say, uh, how, how good are they doing on allowing themselves, allowing their people uh, to have this sort of hum- human flourishing, which is goes to what it means to be really fully human dignified in a, in a human way, right? What we're doing is sort of taking a 19th century German model of what it means to be human and using it as the measuring stick to measure everybody else in the world, right? So, so, uh, so here's the problem. It's kind of a trap because I'm not, I'm not going to make a case for oppressive governments, right? I mean, I really am. I, I, I believe in this, in this uh, theological anthropology of, of human flourishing, right? But I, but when we use it to make judgments about the quality of groups around the world, it always makes us look the best. I mean, we're really just like Hegel here, right? We're always on the vanguard and everybody else is trailing in our wake. Uh, and that's, that's just sort of, I think, a trap, an intellectual conceptual trap that's just at the very heart of modernity that we can't think our way out of yet, right? But at least we can be aware of it. The one solution, I think, to go back to your question you asked me about five minutes ago that I've been trying to answer, right? The one solution is to listen, right? To, I mean, the Hegel's problem is that he thinks he can speak for these folks, right? Uh, but to listen to what's important to them, uh, and that's hard to do, right? Because it's challenging uh, and because it means being quiet for a while. But But if you do that, and you can do that either informally by actually talking to people, you can do it in the, in the context of courses in colleges uh, and in church groups, you can actually get a sense of the, the real differences between people and what's important to other people, mm-hmm. not what you're assuming is important to them. Right. Uh, so if, if, if for folks who are interested in the academic study of religion, there's a brilliant book by Saba Mahmoud called the politics of piety, where she, she does field work with these women in mosques in Cairo, these women look horribly oppressed to Westerners and particularly to Western feminists. And what Saba Mahmoud ends up saying is actually uh, they've got a different model of, they've got a different theological anthropology and they are actually quite robustly uh, building um, a model of agency that just looks funny to us, but it's, it's, it's from their context, it's actually quite powerful. Mm-hmm. That, that's a, that's a, that kind of book is rare. Mm-hmm. That Saba Mahmoud book. So when when you um, are, are bringing this kind of study for uh, of race and religion, its relationship with the nineteenth century, into a classroom where you have uh, students who are going to serve in churches, denominations, social activists, and that kind of thing it, today, where America is, continues to uh, wrestle with uh, race and religion, um, how does this story, this narrative, this uh, research uh, help? impact the way you want to equip your students as future leaders of the church to wrestle with these issues. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, uh, that's the dream, right? Because, uh, because I teach a few classes and I like to read and write my books. Right. But, but the, the real beauty of teaching at a place like I is you work with these students who are actually going to go out, uh, and have a big impact in different organizations across the country. So that's, that's really a privilege to work with them. Uh, and and part of what I hope they see is, uh, a I think it's it's shocking, particularly for white students. Uh, the you, we we swim in a sea of whiteness, and it's hard to see, right? It's the water we swim in, right? So just for some students, just seeing that there is such a thing as white privilege in the first place is is uh, hard to get their minds around, right? So that's sort of stage mm-hmm. one. Um, uh, but then even for the sort of well-intentioned, well-meaning students, it's very easy to say, okay, there's a history of oppression in this country. Uh, I would like to make my mark by helping, uh, historically marginalized peoples 
have more of an opportunity. This is not the way they put it to be like me. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so that may not be the best. I mean, that's nice, but that may be the wrong move. Right. So then the, the, the next stage is to get them to see, okay, actually, uh, in working with communities, the trick is figuring out what the communities need, what they want. That, that may not be the case. And this has policy implications for like child and human services. What do we consider a good home, a good home environment? Right. Uh, what, what kinds of it has policy implications for healthcare? It's got policy implications for all kinds of things. Right. Uh, but the but the trick is going to be not to just impose this one model of what it means to be fully human. Even if you're well intentioned trying to get everybody into that model, mm. that may not be the model that they really want to be in, right? So so the trick is how do I figure out what these people actually want and need from me? And that's going to take some stepping back and listening. Mm -hmm. The um when you kind of emphasize this role of theological anthropology, uh, if in, in, in the church for a lot of different reasons, uh, remains, uh, pretty uh, segregated at the congregational level. Yeah. Um, what are, you know, elements, uh, or problematic elements of, of that anthropology that we should learn to be attentive to in teaching, preaching and, um, and, you know, and introducing the faith to uh, another generation. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, I, the church is super segregated, right? It's, it's, it's at least, if not more segregated than other parts of American society. And I think partly it's this link between religion and culture that makes it that way. Right. So everybody, uh, every progressive Christian says, I want to have an integrated congregation, but that's actually pretty hard to pull off because, because, um, well, for cultural reasons, I mean, does that mean that, that, that what's your worship service going to look like? Right. Uh, and, and, uh, do you want people who look different from you to come to your church, but to act just like you, or are you willing to change it up a little bit, uh, and make yourself uncomfortable so that other people are more comfortable? So that's a hard, that's a hard sort of set of issues to work out. Of. Um, uh, but I think that's why Sunday morning is so segregated, right? That, 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 that people feel culturally comfortable in very different kinds of worship environments, right? Um, uh, I think, I think the lesson then is, uh, for churches is, um, uh, I'm sorry, the train of your question is slipping away from me. You well, wanted to know what churches can do? Well, like when, w you, you kind of emphasize the role of, of anthropology, of yeah. theological anthropology. And, uh, and, and I think, uh, that's what we're discussing all the time. You know, when, in, in worship, we're teaching in anthropology and how we sing, what we sing, yeah. who sits where, um, who gets to talk, who doesn't get to talk. Um, it, we're teaching it in how we in, interpret text that the church is on, you know, continue to interpret over and over again. Yeah. Uh, who's in, and when you, if in one sense, uh, part of the continued segregation of the church is in part, uh, something that I, I've been thinking about recently after people I've interviewed have brought it up, uh, that, um, that sometimes the con, like when you are a person of privilege and you're wanting, uh, your church to integrate and stuff, uh, what you're giving up, is, uh, not a lot. Uh, okay. but when your worship services is, is a place where you gather as a minority in a population where you're preserving a history, a tradition of resistance, uh, in, in the United States, then it's might be more costly for you. And it, it yeah. might not be creating the context for your kids or grandkids that you want. And I, I had never thought of that. And I was, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And a couple different conversations that, uh, were on the podcast mentioned, uh, uh, something you talk about in the book, the notion of, of encounter, um, and of contact time and the ways in which, uh, a, a lot of our theological reflection, I think what it means to be human, uh, and what it means to be, uh, to have a community and how you relate across difference, the, the same words gather different meaning, uh, yeah. when there's actual face time and contact time. Yeah. Uh, who we mean when we say, uh, give us today our daily bread is very different when you've only sat in a room with, uh, you know, upper middle class white people in the United States right. or, or you start to cultivate an us that is the global body of Christ. Then that prayer is one that we go, Oh, there's obligations on us. Um, right. 
And yeah, want- no, that's very true. And and actually, I think one of the tough things is the uh, it's it takes you know, it takes face to face contact, right? And that's very difficult. I mean, it's even difficult. Like in a city like Denver, uh, it's it's hard enough to get sort of a, an upper middle class white congregation together with an African American congregation. And even that, as you point out, can be sort of dangerous because what's what's at stake for the African American congregation, right? That would be a disaster for them if suddenly their membership was overwhelmingly white, right? I mean, uh, the, the 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 black church plays a huge important role in in the uh, in the identity, but also like the political clout of the, of the African American community, right? So so they don't want to lose that. Uh, that would be very dangerous for them, right? So, the, so, so, so the, how do you have the face to face encounter, which is real and meaningful, which doesn't put the vulnerable community more at risk, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if you think about what you just said, like, how do you do that globally? Like, how, what about Christians in India? Like, how do we have face to face contact there or Africa? Like that, that's, um, that's a big challenge. That's a huge challenge. <laughs> well, and, and I think it's important just because, uh, in, in one sense, there's enough distance between us and Hegel and Schleiermacher that we see them start fitting people into a taxonomy and we're like, oh, that's creepy. That's awkward. And, and yet, and the other side of it is we, that, that's, that one still functions today, whether or not we want to look at it. Right. And, and until it's challenged, uh, directly, um, I'm pretty sure the World Bank is going to cooperate with things working out. You know, you know, based on Hegel's map, even though he's not hanging out with us. Yeah, I think that's a great example. The, the the model of development, I think, is based on that still 19th century model of what we have a pretty good idea of where you should get to, and we'll give you the funds to get there. You know, with interest, but we'll give you the funds oh, to with get interest, there. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, yeah, no, that's that's a tough one, um, and I, I think that's that's. I mean, the book uh, walks through a lot of 19th century philosophy and theology right but the bottom line point is the one you just made which is that uh which is that we have these assumptions about theological anthropology um and and we use them unthinkingly when we're sort of talking about different kinds of people in the world right and 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 so uh it's difficult if you're not paying close attention to look at groups say in the muslim world or look at african-american churches and not think oh uh they may be authentically wonderful, beautiful, but they're a little bit pre-modern, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, okay. So now you're back on con scale of like pre-modern. I'm a little bit more modern and, and we're heading towards this distant goal and they're just behind, right? There's better ways of talking about how people are different, right? Which, which, which fight against this idea that we're all on the same trajectory towards the same goal. Uh, but that takes some study and some conversation to understand where they're coming from and not just say, you're different from me you must be a little bit behind me on this historical scale. Yeah. So um, if if, uh, there's, you know, these elements of 19th century thinking that are, that are unconscious and around today, um, what what are, what are some, what are, what are parts of the 19th century you love? And you're like, man, we should probably bring this back. Like if if, if everyone was going to put a little more Schleiermacher in their life. Yeah. Well, so (laughs) I do think that's actually a good thing. Right. So, so I think, in a sense, there's a there's a kind of a catch twenty two here. Uh, uh, in terms of, uh, let's just stick with um, with Christianity for a sec. I actually am deeply moved by Schleiermacher's theological model. I think it's uh, um, uh, it resonates for me, right? Because I don't want to have to believe in stuff that I think is irrational to be a member of the community, right? Um, and I think it captures uh, some important facets of what of what makes human life meaningful, right? Um, so I think he does a brilliant job of that. Uh, and I think his model of religion is, on the whole, a healthier model than what's uh, out there in a lot of at least sort of the media's presentation of American Christianity, right? So, so ev- there's a whole lot of churches I would love to give a nice big dose of Schleiermacher to, right? Um, the, the, so, so, so the trick is this, or the problem is this, right? It's not that you can separate out, oh, here's the good part of Schleiermacher that would be beneficial to everybody. And here's the sort of part that makes them look at Jews and Australians kind of cross-eyed and not very fairly, right? They're all wrapped up together, right? Mm-hmm. So, so he's a good guy, 
and he gets caught in these traps where he, where he, where he looks at other people and sort of, uh, places them on the back burner of history or the slower track of history, right? That's linked to the way he thinks about, about the good stuff that I like about him. And so part of what, part of what I want people to see is, uh, these things come wrapped up together, right? It's hard to separate them out. It may be impossible to separate them out. Mm -hmm. Well, um, luckily we don't have stuff wrapped up with us that in later (laughs) generations we'll discover was ugly. And, uh, (laughs) right. No, we're good. We're good. Yeah. We're we're pretty close to the end of history. Mm Mm-hmm. So, um, when you, uh, you mentioned that, uh, that Schleiermacher kind of saw himself first as a preacher and, 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 and and maybe you could say just, just a bit about that because, uh, you know, we're coming up on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation and, um, Protestants are very word centric and, and preaching centric. And, uh, there's regularly, or, 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 and it's probably it, f- true for good reasons that um, the more progressive side of Christianity has continued to de-emphasize uh, the preaching task and the the role of proclamation. Uh, it is a the, it's also been opened up um, <laughs> over time. And yeah. I've all, I've found Schleiermacher's uh, actual sermons uh, powerful, um, but also the way in which he sees the responsibility of the minister uh, to the congregation and the role the sermon plays in that relationship. Yeah. So that's, so, so that's really interesting. Uh, just one historical note. So on the 300th anniversary of the reformation, right in 1817, uh, one of the things that Schleimacher did in Germany was he unified uh, the reformed and the Lutheran churches uh, because he sort of thought, well, these, some of the theological differences used to be important, but most parishioners can't really, uh, tell you what the difference is. And so it's like an artificial distinction, which, which, uh, makes us superstitious, right? Instead of actually genuinely yeah. religious. So, so on the 300th anniversary of the Reformation, he actually has a, ser- a service where it's him and a Lutheran colleague. He's reformed together performing communion. Uh, and the Prussian church, uh, uh actually the, the church that Tillich was, was ordained in is actually a unified Lutheran reformed church. Um, all right. So the, to go back to the sermon, uh, for Schleiermacher, what, what church is, is, uh, it's a gathering of people who have the shared experience of redemption, right? So you don't need to make them have that experience. They're there because they've had it, according to him. Uh, what you do need to do though is to kind of jack that feeling up because it gets drained, you know, as you go through your daily life. Uh, uh, and so he's got this really quite brilliant and sadly it's not translated into English practical theology where he, he sort of breaks down how to construct a, a worship service to sort of get people uh, re-energized in their faith, right? And he talks about, you know, which hymns should come where and what the sermon does. And, and in the sermon, uh, what happens is the minister basically makes a self-presentation of, uh, of his religious experiences in Schleiermacher's they always a hymn. Uh, uh, in such a way that people can see how he's been moved by this experience of redemption. And in that way, he compares it to like going to a patriotic festival, right? If you go to the 4th of July parade, uh, it, even if you're ambiguous about the, you know, American foreign policy, right? When the band comes by and the flag comes by, you feel this welling up of pride, right? That's what church should do. That's what the role of the minister is to, is to, is to talk about their experience of Christian faith and how it relates to what's going on in the world in such a way that people come out of there kind of jazzed up. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into the decline of the mainline denominations, but high up on the list has got to be super boring sermons. Yeah. And, and, and it, it wasn't like he, he's not sitting there going like, Oh, you need to manipulate them emotionally and all this kind of thing. But he is saying like a sermon is not a 12 minute lecture. Right. Um, and, and the other side of it that I find important, and it also, for me, problematizes a way a lot of our more progressive uh, denominations do theological education. His assumption is that a minister has, as part of their piety in regular life, passionate encounters with God by engaging biblical text. Yeah. And that when you read a text theologically, you're not reading it with historical criticism in mind and all that kind of stuff. It informs his reading. It's part of what he's doing. But there is a uh, a practice of Schleiermacher's own piety in his own life uh, where he encounters 
um, Christ by engaging the text. And yeah. he is then inviting it into his life and then inviting people to encounter God by engaging the text in the sermon. Yeah. And he's not going, well, this is just how I feel. Maybe you could do it this way or, or the worst liberal sermons. Y'all don't have to believe this to be a Christian. Like, right. it's not like he doesn't, di- he's already told you that he's very critical thinking. He's like, yeah, but that's not a sermon. A right. sermon in, in, you know, like when you've encountered God as mediated by Jesus, and that's the thing you say that identifies yourself, locates yourself, then exactly how you explain the resurrection is like a secondary issue. Right. Um, and now I think we're so scared as Christians to actually confess, proclaim, and to, and to take, uh, sermons as an actual art form. Yeah. Seriously, that we get up and either preach self-help things with a v- Bible verse attached, uh, we get uncomfortable saying the word Christ because, uh, we, we're so worried about whatever it has ever been done in his name. Right. And, uh, and we don't, we don't teach, uh, ministers to have this robust, but very, the founder of liberal theology relationship with, with the text yeah. and, and to, to, to recognize the art form of worship and of sermons that, you know, like we get outdone by TED talks every week. Right. Right. No. So, so Schleiermacher, the goal of theological education for Schleiermacher, the goal, what every seminary student should be aiming for, what every minister should be is he says, you should never, you should know the Bible so well that you never experience anything that's going on in the world without immediately a Bible verse, Bible verse springing to mind. And you should never read the Bible without immediately some contemporary application springing to mind. Right. And I think one of the, I mean, this is, this is, uh, I think one of the things we face at ILIF, right, with our, you know, amazingly diverse and wonderful student body, but a lot of them just don't know the Bible that well, right? If you're going to move somebody out there, if, if we're going to train you in the middle of Denver and then send you to a parish in Wyoming, if you want to move those people, you're going to move them with the Bible, right? So you better know it pretty darn well. And I, I, I think progressive Christianity has kind of ceded the Bible to the conservatives, and I think that's a big mistake. Yeah, I mean, I found... Uh, I had a student joke with me when I was, uh, uh, teaching at Claremont during classwork that, uh, I quoted the Bible in the systematic theology class more than they did in their New Testament class. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> like, really? <laughs> How'd yeah. that work out? But, um, yeah, so the, anyway, we don't have to keep uh, going on it, but I, 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 I'm, I'm a Schleiermacher fan. I recently would, you know, the new translation of the Christian faith came out. Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be a session out at the AAR this year. And, and I decided, uh, when I finished my dissertation and, or defended the dissertation that, uh, I, I was going to go through the Christian faith, like Lectio Divina style. Wow. That's so, awesome. Because I, I like Schleiermacher and, um, you have a new translation. I've never, I've never read it like outside of, being told you have to read it. And when you're in grad school, they're like, Hey, next week we're going to talk about 300 pages of the Christian right. faith um, or whatever. So uh, it is going very slow uh, because there's so many parts of it that are rich that I'm like, Oh, well, like he, when he lays out the six different heresies and how the church always has these same six heresies yeah. and stuff. Like if, if you saw that as a lecture outline, it would look, you're like, Oh, this is going to be some apologetics, conservative stuff, whatever. And all three, uh, like when he's going through the three pairings of heresies, they're all, uh, the way in which a doctrine shapes the life of one who calls Jesus the Christ. Yeah. And so the, the perversion of the heresies are the way when you, if you operate in them, you misunderstand the way you as a, as a Christian and as the Christian community relate to Christ in your ongoing living. Um, yeah. No, that's right. That's right. So, so, so it's, so, I mean, he's a great dogmatic theologian, right? But it's not about the doctrines for him. And, and he's got, as you said before, he's got this great sort of theory of language where, where what theology is, is you have an experience and there's sort of three levels of language, right? At first you just go like, Oh my God. Right. Yeah. And then, and then somebody says, so that's, he calls out the poetic level. And then somebody says, Hey, what's going on? And you sort of try to put into words like what's happening that he calls the rhetorical level. That's sort of first order discourse. That's just the way we talk to each other in the world. Right. And then the theologian does one more thing, which is th- this third level of language, which is they try to put the second level into kind of a rigorous scientific language. Right. 
but he's not doing philosophy. He's not arguing that this is the way you should see the world. It, it all rests back on the foundation stone of the original experience, right? So if you, if you don't read it that way, you, you miss, this is, I think, Bart's mistake, right? Although Bart had enough respect for Schleiermacher's piety that he couldn't stop reading him for his whole life, right? But Bart thinks that Schleiermacher, uh, is too infected by philosophy to be doing good theology. But Schleiermacher's self-understanding is, I'm just unpacking that original aha experience I had when I felt redeemed, right? When I had that conversion experience at the Moravian, Moravian Seminary, I'm just bringing that out into ever sort of more, um, uh, ever more concise language until finally you get this whatever 600-page thing, which is a little hard to plow through, but it's all about piety. Mm-hmm. So you said the the first – the he identifies the poetic as that kind of personal subjective experience of the, oh, my God, like the event yeah. happens. And then the what's going on question, that second level is kind of related to the community. Yeah. So so the second level is the so preaching, he, say, he says, is the second level. Right. So so you have this experience and you just it's like when you stub your toe and you say, ouch. And then somebody says, like, trip, what's wrong? And then and at that level, you're sort of trying to unpack your experience so that somebody else can understand it. Right. That's the level of preaching. Uh, where you say, Hey, this is what, this is what I experienced. And this is why it moved me. And this is why it's a beautiful thing. Right. Uh, and that's, and, and, and that's the level at which preachers should be preaching. Right. And then if you want to go to a university and say, okay, uh, uh, let's put this into real technical language and really see how these different, uh, how these different expressions, his phrases, how do they hang together? Right. How do you, how do you connect that feeling to what I think about Jesus and what I think about God and what I think about sin and what I think about all this stuff. Okay. At that level, then the language can get technical, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't come back to the second level. And then ultimately to this first level of, Oh my God, I just had that experience. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you start to see the, a very different function for theology and its relationship to, um, the religious life. I, I wonder how his framework would be required to shift or would need a shift or be best challenged when you, um, kind of take into account kind of three factors of that have changed significantly. Like one today, God is a contestable conversation. It's not kind of a cultural given, right? And he, and he assumed and thought people thought it was pretty persuasive when he, when he talks to the deist or people that are disengaged with state religion, he, he gets up there and gives the speeches and, uh, and, and those landed and people like, okay, yeah, well, there you go. Schleiermacher. I guess we can put you in charge (laughs) of the university. Um, so like when, when you take the contestability of God and the, um, intensity of pluralism, with other traditions, not your own and such, um, and people that don't, aren't confessionally connected. Like if you take that, uh, that into account, and I guess the third would be, and this is something Tillich kind of emphasized that, uh, our culture is now, uh, it's anxiety is not wrapped around particular theological questions that okay. Schleiermacher going, uh, yeah, let's stop arguing about the third use of the law. Watch this sermon. Like, here's what happens, but are, are around much more philosophical questions or, um, that, uh, the questions I would regularly get asked as a minister are not ones that are necessarily theological. They're more, right. they're more philosophical. Uh, how does this kind of theory of theological reflection change when, um, we have more philosophers in the pews than theologians? Right. Well, yeah, uh, um, I mean, here's the thing that, 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 I mean, if you mentioned again, the speeches, which are addressed to religion's culture despisers, right? These are the people who, who want nothing to do with religion. And it's a nice piece of apologetics, right? Cause he, he begins in speech one saying, Hey, actually, you know, I'm just like you guys, uh, and what you don't realize is you've got the wrong way of th- you think religion is this one thing, right? And I think this actually would still work for a lot of, you know, quote unquote nuns today, right? Uh, you don't like institutional religion because to you it's all about, I don't know, judgmentalism and rules and being bored and all this stuff, right? But let me tell you what religion really is. And it turns out for Schleiermacher that it's about these kind of, uh, I mean, he's dealing with a very specific set of despisers, right? These are, I mean, if they were in America today, they'd hang out like in Hollywood or Manhattan. These are like kind of culturally, uh, cultural luminaries, right? Mm -hmm. 
And he says, actually, uh, uh, what religion is, is just this, this insight into the nature of, of the universe, right? Uh, and you guys, you think you're not religious, you artists and, and poets and playwrights, but actually you guys see this stuff better than anybody, right? So, so you are religious, even though you don't know it. And then he, and then he says, and actually, uh, it helps to cultivate this feeling, this insight. And just so happens there's an institution which is designed to help you cultivate that. And by the time he's in the fifth speech, he's like, Hey, why don't you come with me on Sunday to church? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so I, I think part of, part of, part of, uh, part of this doesn't have to shift, right? If I think the, the claim, the scraping away of, of, uh, negative religion is the, is one of the first moves that Schleiermacher says, Hey, uh, it's, it's not what you think it is, right? It's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's actually something that every human has, and it's this kind of beautiful thing, right? Um, and then on your second point on pluralism, I mean, he, he, his whole model of sort of conversation requires that you talk to people who are different from you, right? His, his whole argument is, look, I've had this one insight. Yours is totally different. If we tell each other about it, each of us has more, more slices of the pie, right? I get a bigger sense of what's going on out there by talking to you, uh, so he's, he's very, uh, it's, I think, an open-minded way of thinking about when I engage you and you're religiously different from me, I don't have a, a horse in the race of trying to get you to be like me. In fact, that would be the worst thing that could happen to me because I'm already like me. I don't need two yeah. of me, right? Uh -huh. uh, so, um, so I think that would play pretty well in today's world. Um, I don't know what kind of what kind of philosophical questions did you get when you're wearing your minister hat? Well, like the um I mean the problem of evil question yeah. uh, gets asked a lot uh I mean like how you understand God in uh connected to science um, yeah. how you get uh how you understand God in uh in religious pluralism yeah. uh, how you understand uh, like is there what is good like how you understand ethics and a world where there, where what's identified as good is completely different in different places. Yeah. Um, what the, and the ethical questions are, are pretty intense. So, um, yeah. you know, sometimes you get them because they're thinking of just like personal ethics questions, recognizing how much things are fluctuating. Like once you, once a congregation is open and affirming, that changes how you think of certain, uh, ethical decision making practices, uh, for, uh, traditions like, um, a lot of, a lot of churches will have their, their theologians and, and leaders will have a, a long theological talk and they get done, tell everyone the decision and put a Bible verse at the end of it as if that's somehow how they got to that decision. Right. And, and it's not. Well, you know, like, like <laughs> being in, being ultimately inclusive, it kind of puts you in a post solo scriptura context. And then you go like, oh, so how does authority work and decision making work and, and stuff if like this isn't how he settle it? Right. Um, and, uh, and, and I think the, uh, the other ones have been uh, people whose, uh, experience, experiential encounters are as intense outside of confessional context or, or even nature than, um, it, like when you are part of a religious tradition, but your own religious experiences, at least in LA, I had yeah. people who effectively practiced multiple religions and, yeah. um, and if you ask them about it, they're happy to tell you, uh, they're, they don't see a contradiction in it, in it. They just know either they're like, but there should be, right? Like, isn't there something wrong, <laughs> wrong here? And, and, uh, no, but I do think you're right in the sense that, uh, Schleiermacher kind of, uh, models a type of openness to the lived experience of other tradition and other people and just individuals in the congregation that's hard to do when you have such a rigid understanding of revelation like in Bart and in a and that that the reality or the possibility for Christian theology for Bardians and friends uh requires a rejection of um human beings just being anthropologically religious or spiritual right. Uh, beings. Right. No, that's, uh, that, that is, I think the, the, the kind of unbridgeable gulf between them is, is that Schleiermacher thinks human beings are religious and Bart thinks that they're not. And to claim that they are is to sort of impose human categories on God. Um, 
Yeah. So the, uh, I mean, the thing that's interesting, we had that conversation earlier about Schleiermacher and the Bible and how preachers should always have a Bible verse in mind and always think about the Bible when they're thinking about the world. But, but for Schleiermacher, one of the things that's interesting is, and one of the points he makes in the Christian faith is, you know, the disciples didn't have a Bible. Right. I mean, they had Jesus, right? They met, they confronted his personality. But for Schleiermacher, that's what happens when you, when you go to church, right? Is, is yeah. that Schleiermacher's personality is still embedded and embodied in the congregation. I mean, you know, you know, there's some dysfunction too, but, but in there also is Jesus' personality. So, so for as seriously as he takes the Bible, uh, the sort of touchstone for Schleiermacher is, is again, the experience of redemption, which you find when you join the community. Uh, and if there's a particular Bible phrase uh, uh, that's causing you trouble, you can argue about what that phrase means or how important it is without putting your faith at risk because your faith isn't based on that. Your right. faith is, is based on, hey, I'm part of this community, right? Which opens up a whole freedom to have arguments about, you know, oppressive verses in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. So how do you – how would uh, Schleiermacher then – uh, see the role of like the, the creeds or the, or the ecumenical councils. Cause yeah. I think a lot of denominations, the uh, Protestant ones post sola scriptura are going like, all right, okay, we can't, we can't get everyone to believe or at least pretend to believe that the Bible is obviously clear and fixes this. I mean, I've even seen Southern Baptists going, oh, well, that, that's not creedal Christianity. And you're like, wait. <laughs> Yeah, you know who invented that? <laughs> Catholics. But, um, w- w- like, how would you, like, how would Schleiermacher see those kind of historic, uh, uh, definitions of the faith? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so, so as you're reading through the Christian faith and the new translation, just pay attention to the things that he footnotes, right? Because for Schleiermacher, if it's true that his systematic theology is an unpacking of his, sort of rhetorical preaching. And that's an unpacking of this sort of gut experience of redemption that he had. Right. Um, uh, your, your religious experience is formed by the community of which you're a member. Right. And, and Christians all share something in common, uh, but different Christian denominations have uh, more or less different specific I don't know. The feeling is shaped slightly differently in different denominations, right? Mm-hmm. So it makes sense for Schleiermacher that they would, um, as you sort of go up the language tree and they're trying to unpack their feelings, that they would come up with different creeds, right? So when Schleiermacher is trying to, so his, his theology, his dogmatic theology is written specifically for this one community, right? Which is the unified Prussian church, uh, and it's for the students in seminary who are training to be ministers in that tradition. When he wants to say, so he's trying to unpack the experience of that community. He's not unpacking Christian experience. He's unpacking the, the experience of that community. And so when he tries to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I think I'm doing a pretty good job of this, all of his notes refer to specific Protestant creeds that belong to those traditions, right? Mm-hmm. And he never, so much more often than he says, hey, we see this in the Bible, right? Because the Bible isn't what distinguishes Reformed Christians from other Christians, right? All the Christians have the Bible, it's it's the specific whatever Westminster Catechism that's going to distinguish a certain kind of Calvinist from a Catholic, right? So those are the those are the places he goes to, and he's not saying we've got it right and they've got it wrong. He's just saying this is our communal experience, and these are the documents which sort of try to detail how we think about our experience. Mm-hmm. So the um, so when you uh, think of the the different places that your, your students go. And, um, and, and I always think if you hear from a student five years after you taught them, then you know, you succeeded in something like if, if yeah. anything lingered that long. Yeah. Uh, so, or, or, or when I'm at beer camp and meet some of the students, what do you want when you're not around for them to say they learned about you or learn from you or taking out of the classes? Uh, <laughs> okay, that's like the hundred thousand dollar question. Uh, um, I think there's a couple things. Um, I, I mean, I think everybody's got their own reasons for engaging with these figures and with these texts, right? I mean, I've got mm-hmm. my own set of, of of like personal intellectual issues that I'm trying to work through as I do this stuff, right? Uh, I guess my hope is that. Um, f- 
for me, what theology is, is I always tell my students, I have like a broad definition of theology and a narrow definition of theology, right? Well, I think every human being has a theology in the sense that they, that they have a worldview. They have a way that they make meaning and sense out of life. They may not do it reflectively or they may not be able to articulate it, but they've got it right. I think you're better off doing it reflectively. Uh, and the narrow sense of theology is that you do this in conversation with a specific set of traditional texts that have come from the Christian tradition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so for all of my students, no matter how they identify Christian, non-Christian, or which part of the Christian tradition, right? I would hope that they have learned how to read texts that are, I mean, when you read old theologians they're foreign right they, they use funny language and they have odd ideas and sometimes they say horrible things right but i hope that they've learned a way to engage those texts so that they can enter into a genuine conversation which helps them reflect on articulate and work out their own worldview wherever that falls on the range of christianities or not christianities right but but you know you're just a better human for having read augustine's confessions you just are well, I'm not going to argue with you. But, uh, <laughs> but that takes some work because when you pick it up, it's like, well, this guy's a crazy lunatic from the 5th century, right? Well, he's the mo it's probably the most popular. Uh, yeah. when it, I mean, the guy, the, the guy, how many, most people feel bad passing on their mommy and sex issues to their kids. Yeah. Now, Augustine, he's like, I don't even, I don't even need kids to pass on my junk. I'm going right. to write this one book and. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it works great with 18-year-olds. When I used to teach at Liberal Arts College, they love the book two of the Confessions. Works great. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so so thank you so much for for talking and hanging out. I realized we even went longer than normal because, well, mostly because we started talking about Schleiermacher in 19th yeah. century people. I I I I, I really enjoy it, um, and I'm I'm real excited about getting to see you in Denver this August at uh, beer camp. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. And, and uh, you know, it's great to talk uh, with somebody who likes and appreciates Schleiermacher. It doesn't happen that often, so I've loved it. <laughs>